Take your Bibles, if you would, uh, and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to read some things here in Matthew 5, then we're going to go to the book of Ecclesiastes, then we're going to go all over the place in the Bible. And uh, I'm just going to teach you. I'm going to teach you some things that God showed me several years ago that uh, he helped me tremendously. I remember one time uh, being here at this altar here, and, and God was just dealing with me about things in my life and things uh, in our church and, and ministry and different things like that. And uh, I, I was just praying and praying and praying, and, and I was asking God questions. I was asking him, you know, why are things the way they are? <clears throat> why is it that as a Christian... How come I don't always feel like I am victorious? How come it, uh, sometimes it feels like that I'm being defeated uh, or things are not going well? Or I, I mean, I remember the times in my life, I remember the times uh, when uh, it just seemed like I was on the mountain of God. And boy, I'll tell you what, I, I, once you get there, you just think that nobody's going to ever bring you down again. I'm not going to have any problems anymore. I've finally reached this level in Christianity where, I mean, things are great. And, and I promise God that it'll never be any, any way else ever again in my life. I remember thinking that. And then all of a sudden the crash would come. And I would be, I mean, I would be down way, way, way down low. And uh, I would say, God, I, I, pro I said that I was never going to uh, fall from you again. I said I was never going to disobey you again. And yet here I am. And the feelings of guilt of letting God down, the feelings of guilt of letting myself down and my church and my family and, and on and on and on. I remember that. And it was just, it was driving me insane. It was, it was what, it, what, what it was. And I remember being praying, I'm praying about that. God, please help me. God, show me things. God, do something with me. Either make me completely victorious where I don't have any sin ever again. You ever prayed that? God, just take it all away. God, I never want to sin again. Never want to disobey you. Never want to do anything wrong ever again. And I don't know if maybe that's been planted in our minds by... Uh, by maybe sermons we've heard in the past. I'm not knocking that. Or maybe that's just the devil saying, now try to get up to that level now. Or I tell you what part of it is. Part, part of it is that church people sit and watch Christian television. And they watch these bozos on TV. And they see these guys uh, act like there's never anything wrong in their life. And they never have any problems. And they've reached this high level of Christian success. And they just don't have any problems. And they never come down from it. And we think, boy, why can't I be like that? And uh, God began to deal with me from that moment forward. God began to show me things and God began to tell me some things that I'm going to share with you uh, in this little talk we're doing here. And I remember one time in particular, what drove me <clears throat> into this study of the Word of God was one year I was out deer hunting. And uh, usually when I go deer hunting, it's that time where I get along with God and, and I usually got a rifle in one hand and a Bible in the other. And uh, I remember sitting out uh, sort of over an embankment and I was looking out uh, just I was in the woods and I was just looking out and there was a there was a little river that runs down where I was <clears throat> and I was watching that river and I was just praying to God and and talking with God and communing and fellowshipping with God and I, I just love and treasure those times <clears throat> and God and God said Mike do you see that river yeah I see it I'm looking right at it. And it was like God was, was whispering to me through the Holy Ghost of God. And I believe in that. I believe the Holy Ghost will, will speak to us and he will be real to us. But it will always coincide with the written word of God. It will never be separate from that. <clears throat> and God was asking me, Mike, which, which way is that river going? And, uh, or where is that river right now? <clears throat> and I said, it's low. And God said, and where is it going? I said, it's getting lower all the time. And he said, I want you to think about that. And God began to uh, show me things in the Bible. And we're going to go to Ecclesiastes. We're going to see that in the scriptures. Uh, but um, after God began to deal with me, I heard it. Uh, we have a, a pastor friend of our church, Pastor Reg Kelly, down in Norwood, Missouri. And uh, God had given him a similar teaching on this, that as he preached it, I real, realized and recognized that it was true. Not just because he was saying it, because I recognized it from the word of God. And so we're going to look at some things and we're going to talk about the cycles of Christian growth. The cycles of Christian growth. 
Is it, is it supposed to be in our walk with Jesus that we're just supposed to get better and better and better and we achieve this level? Kind of like, you know, the mystery religions they all have these levels of initiation. Is it supposed to we get, we get better and better and better and then all of a sudden we reach a point where we just never do anything wrong ever again and nothing ever goes wrong in our life and we live in this super victory all the time? Or does our Christian life match that of practically everything that God created, does it go in cycles? And I'm going to give you just the plain teaching of the scriptures today. But I want us to start in Matthew chapter 5, and verse 1, And seeing the multitude, he went up to a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Now he's giving, this is like the first real sermon that he's, he's given to his disciples. And this is called, we call this the Beatitudes, and people call it other things. But I want you to just follow the progression here that he uses. And then we're going to go look and see this in the book of Ecclesiastes. So he said in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now that is low. That's being in a situation where you are low. <clears throat> and then he said, verse 4, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. And we're also going to count some things here because uh, it, it indicates a pattern that God is displaying for us. So we have blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn. And then we have blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. Number four. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they shall be filled. That's the fourth thing that he said. Number five. Blessed are the merciful. For they shall obtain mercy. Number six, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Number seven, which is verse nine, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And then number eight, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we have eight things here, and yet there's nine, because if you look in verse 11, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now I want you, I want you to think about this, and, and this number here, there's eight Number eight is the number for new life and new beginnings. When you have the, the, the picture of a week, you start with the first day of the week, which is Sunday, and it goes around, and to the seventh day of the week, which is the end of the week, and the day after that would be the eighth day, but it's also the first day all over again. It is cyclical in, in what it's doing. If you look at the pattern in the book of Genesis, you have Genesis chapters 1 through 7 that, be, that show the beginning and the end of God's work here on the earth. In Genesis chapter 7, God ended it with a flood. And yet in Genesis chapter 8, God takes eight people off of the ark and he brings them into a new world. And that cycle started all over again. And by the way, that cycle is going to come around again because Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And so these cycles are, are apparent there with the number eight. And yet this number eight leads us into the, the ninth thing that he says when he uses the word blessing there or blessed. And let me just say this to you. The word blessing is a salvation word. You're not blessed if you're not saved. And yet if you are saved, you are blessed. And I want you to think of that word blessed or blessing because we're going to go to another place in the scripture and I'm going to show you something that hopefully will help you. And you have to ask yourself, well, Pastor Mike, why are you doing this teaching? Why are you recording this on video? I mean, don't you normally talk about prophecy and the end times and the beast and, and the rapture and all this stuff? Yes, but I want to tell you something. Those things are ahead of us. They are not with us right now. We have to live in the here and now right now. And I believe in that. And not everything that we should focus on as, as Christians should be about the new world order and who's going to do this and who's going to do that. And uh, Obama's going to let gays in the military again. That's not what we should all primarily focus on. Because we have to live this life. We have to be in our families. We have to be in our church. And I will tell you that this, this thing that I'm going to teach you exists in every realm of life that you have. Whether it's your personal life or you'll see it in your family. Or you'll see it in your church or your ministry. 
We see it in this country, and historically you can look and see that there are patterns of where this nation served God, and then it fell, and God, uh, God crippled them, and then they cried out and they served God. You see, you see patterns of revival uh, inside of even our nation. And so the number eight is the number for new life, but he gives this blessing again, this double blessing. And I could ask you today, how many of you would like a double blessing? And God's going to give a double blessing, but he's got to do it in his order and in his way. And besides that, we need to realize and remember that Christianity is God's work in us, not our work for God. It is what God is doing in us to produce. Now watch this, because he says, blessed are ye. He says that for the ninth time. And the number nine is a number for fruit bearing. So I could ask you, how many of you would like to have the fruit of the Spirit inside of your life tonight? How many of you would like to have the fruit and the, and the goodness that God wants to produce in you so that you could be a blessing to other people? You want to be blessed so that you can be a blessing and be fruitful in everything that you say and do. And so that is the calling of our life. It's about what God is going to do in us and not what we're going to do for God. So I want you to just kind of get that in your mind is that we're talking about new life and regeneration or the theme of revival. But then we're talking about the effects of revival in our life, which is the fruitfulness that should be manifested in our life. And God always has a way to do that. And I just want you to, because I'm smiling right now, because I know where I'm going with this. And this whole idea of a tree, I want you to think about. Now I'll take your Bible, turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, if you would. And I remember one time, uh, boy, I just seemed like I get some of my best sermons out on the deer stand. I was sitting out in a deer stand one year, uh, sitting out in the middle of an open field. And uh, I'm sitting there, I've got a little Bible I carry around when I go deer hunting. And I'm sitting there and God, what do you want me to read? And I just, one of those deals where you just open your Bible up and there it is. And I opened up to the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, I started reading that for a little bit. And God said, now back up. And read what's written in your King James Bible. Read the title. And it says the Ecclesiastes or the preacher. And it starts out the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. And God said, Mike, are you not the preacher? And I said, well, God, I try to be. And he said, this is the message that you as a preacher carry to people. And if you read the book, if, by the way, if you're ever in a really, really, really good mood and just want to be brought down from it, read the book of Ecclesiastes, all right? Because it'll tell you that there's vanity and vexation in this world. Solomon said, I had the wine, the women, the wealth, the power. I had everything in this world. And he said, I will tell you that it's vanity, that it's vexation of the soul. And it, it literally got him nowhere in life. And so that's the message that we as preachers need to be telling people. Everybody says, oh, we, you know, we need a positive message. I, I go to the so-and-so church because they give me a positive message about how I can have my best life now. And I'm here to tell you folks <clears throat> that your best life is not right now. It's not supposed to be. Your best life is the one that's awaiting you in glory. And so anyway, but he's, he talks about right off the bat in the book of Ecclesiastes. I want you to look at this in verse 4. He said, so now Solomon's wise. Remember that. Solomon has the wisdom of God. And he says, one generation passeth away and another generation cometh. That's a cycle. And he said, but the earth abideth forever. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down. That's a cycle. And hasteth to his place where he arose. So you get the, every day, every day God's trying to teach you this cycle. He's trying to teach you this pattern, this, this reality in your life of how things really are. Not the way that some people make it out to be. How things really are to be in our lives. God's showing us this because just as sure as the sun came up this morning... The sun's going to go back down this evening and just as sure as it went down, as it goes down this evening, it's going to come back up in the morning. And that's what God's trying to show us here. So then he says, verse six, the wind goeth toward the south and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually and the wind returneth again according to his what? His circuits. Circle is a cycle. That's the, the two words there are, are, are similar in their root. A circle is a cycle. And he's talking about, first he's talking about the, the generations of the earth, the generations of man. And he, then he's talking about the sun cycle. And then he's talking about the wind cycle. Now I want you to watch this in verse 7. <clears throat> because this is what God was showing me sitting out on that deer stand watching that river. He said, all the rivers run into the sea. And yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. I just want you to think about that, okay? 
because we're going to, we're just going to kind of walk through the Bible here and we're going to talk and I'm going to use the illustration of this water cycle to show you the cycles of what happens in our lives. I have, as I said before, I've been up on the mountain and I've been down in the valley. And when I'm down, now that I realize this, now when I get down in the valley, I realize and recognize that it's part of the work that God's doing in me and I'm going to let him do it. And he's going to bring me back up again one of these days. I believe that. But I also, I also know that when I'm up on the mountain, I also know and realize that no matter how long I am able to stay up there, I'm coming back down again. Okay? And so I want you to, and you say, why are you, why are you preaching this, Brother Mike? Because I think that this world, especially in our country, is full of people who at one time used to go to church... And they were, ex they were told that, you know, or they had this, they were taught this or they just developed it in their mind like I did as a child. When I was growing up here in this church as a child, I looked at all these adults, these adult men, especially in this church, and I had them way, way up on a pedestal. And I just had it figured that these guys, these are the guys that never do anything wrong in their life. They've been saved and I hear them talking about, you know, how the, they ought not sin and this and that, the other is wrong and this and that is bad. And when I was growing up, in this church, we were taught standards, we were taught morals, we were taught guidelines that you're to follow that according to the Bible that you don't go away from. And I just had it in my mind that every preacher that ever stood behind this pulpit or every, every man that was here, I'm talking about a young guy, I'm talking about eight, eight years old, I'm thinking these guys are the ones that never sin. And I remember growing into life and I remember thinking, you know, when is that going to happen for me? When is it going to come the time that I'm never, ever, ever going to disobey God ever again? When is that day coming? And it just left me frustrated and, and uh, burdened because I wanted to achieve this, this almost like super Christian status. And that's when God began to teach me something. And I hope that by teaching this, teaching this to you that you realize and recognize that just because, even though you've been up here, just because you're back down here does not mean that God has abandoned you. It does not mean that God has forsaken you. And I'll tell you this. The devil, the devil will never, ever, ever try to get you while you're up here. Okay? He will never try to convince you that you're worthless, no good, that you're not doing God any good, and this and that. He'll, never, he'll always work on you when you get back down here. And you know that. You know that when you're down here, the devil's climbing all over you saying, see, you're not a Christian, see, you're not saved, you're ruining your testimony, and everybody thinks you're fake and you're a phony, and you might as well, watch this now, you might as well give up. And you probably know some people right now that used to go to church somewhere, but they had it in their mind that if they failed, that they're no good, and, and they ought to get out, and that's what the devil did with it. It's not that they don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God anymore. It's not that they don't believe the Bible's the Word of God. It's just that the devil hammered them while they were down in that, in that level there, of, of down in the valley, and it's they, they come to a place that they, and the devil tries to convince them, there's no use, you can't be a Christian anyway, you've done sin, you've done blow it, God doesn't have mercy on you, walk off. And that's what's happened. And so I, if, if nothing else, I'd like for this teaching to save your life in Christ. I'd like for this, this message that I'm giving you to save your marriage, because there'll be cycles in your marriage. If nothing else, I'd like for you as parents to teach this and instill this in your children. Let your children see you broken and bankrupt before God and emptied out and crying and crying. Let your children see that in you. Why? So that your children will not. You, you, we have a tendency to present this idea to our children that we never do anything wrong. We never let them see us down. We never let them, you know, and they, and they get this idea in their mind that, well, you know, daddy lived this life and he never strayed from it and he never did anything. And they see that and then they grow up. They find out that it's not, the, it's not the real. It's not what they thought it would be. And this is one of the reasons why our kids are not in church anymore. This is one of the reasons why your grandkids are not being raised in church. It's just one of the reasons, but it is one of the reasons. And, and so I want to help you. I want, to help, I want this message. I want the word of God to save your marriage. I want it to save your church. Pastors, I want the word of God to help keep you in the pulpit, preaching the old time way. Because as pastors, we recognize that even our churches go in cycles. We're up and we're down, we're up and we're down. And it's, uh, I know the feeling of coming into a church house on Sunday morning after, after last Sunday being one of the best messages I've ever preached in my life. But, and boy, I tell you what, you're way up here 
And then come in the next Sunday and you, it's just like you just fall right before everybody. Can't preach, can't talk, can't think. Or you come in the last Sunday, you had a, had a little campaign going and you had in 100 new people or 50 new people in your church and you thought, boy, here it is. It's going to be easy sailing all the way out. Now that we got them in, they'll stay in. And then you show up the next Sunday and you've dropped, by about, you've dropped more the next Sunday than what you had the previous Sunday. And so I wanted to help you, Pastor. I wanted to help you, Christian, to understand that God always has a work in our lives. I told you a while ago, I want you to take your Bible now, uh, since we're talking about fruit bearing, take your Bible to the, turn to the book of Psalms chapter 1. The book of Psalms chapter 1. Boy, God's going to teach us something, all right? And I want you to think about trees here for a minute, okay? I want you to think about trees. He said in Psalm chapter 1, he said, blessed is the man. Now here's that word blessing again. So I ask you, do you want God to bless your life? The answer is yes, I want God to bless my life and my marriage and my family and my ministry and my church. I want God to bless all these things. But I understand that God's got a way he's going to do that. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. That is three. And the number three points you to what we see in Genesis chapter three, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And all three of those things will kill us. They will, they will destroy everything that we have. So blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate. How? Day and night. You think about that. The laws of God are, is that everything in his creation works in cycles. That's the law. God's the one who said it that way. Okay? But then he wants you to meditate on those things when? During the daytime when the sun's shining bright and everything's good and it's high noon and you're enjoying life because there's light shining in your soul. And he wants you to meditate on these things in the night when it's dark and it's quiet and you're alone and nobody knows, it, nobody in the house knows you're awake, but you're awake and you're laying there in your bed and you're weeping. And you're crying and you're saying, God, why is it this way? God, why am I going through this? God said, if you want a blessing, meditate on my laws. Meditate on how I work in your life. I want you to think on these things. I want you to think about how I'm working in your life. And then he says, watch this now, verse 3, I like it. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That rivers of water is this Bible right here. It's the Holy Ghost. It's, the, it's Jesus in us. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit when? In his season. I want you to think about that. Seasons are cycles. Okay? You do not, and we're in Missouri here, the fruit trees do not bear fruit in the middle of January. They don't. But you think about that. There is always a season for fruit bearing. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Well, nature itself, God's nature itself teaches you that there are times when leaves, leaves flourish and times when they don't. So I want you to picture that, okay? So I want you to imagine trees in the cycles. In fact, take a look at this. Up on, the, up on the screen there, take a look at this. I want you to look at, this is, the, this is what happens when you cut a tree and you look there. And what do you see in this tree? You see rings in this tree. You know what those rings are? I mean, I was taught this, I was taught this from a child. Those rings are the pictures that God draws inside of a tree to show you what happened during that year. Okay? When you look at, especially these old trees, you can, almost, you can almost judge history by what's happened. Every now and then you saw one of these old trees down, and you can tell about 50 some odd years ago there was a fire in those woods, and it scarred that tree. You can s still see that embedded in those rings. But you can trace the life of that tree all the way down from its current time, all the way back into its past, into its birth. Now I want you to think about this. Here it is, a tree, is, a tree comes up from the ground, 
<clears throat> and it's got a lot of life in it and it immediately begins to bear leaves and begins to soak in the blessings of the sun and the rain and the nourishment that's in the ground and it's trying to spread roots out so to give it stability and this and that and the other but it's not very big and it's not very strong and it has a tendency if the wind blows just the right way or if, so, if a deer or something like that running through the woods or whatever it's easily Tramp down. I want you to think about that because when we're, when we're newborn Christians, especially right after you get saved, right after you got saved, you were vulnerable. Because, I mean, you were way up on the mount when you got saved. And uh, the testimony of everybody that comes to me and says, boy, I remember when I got saved. And I remember right after I got saved, the devil was just all over me. And we try to make it sound like, but I determined to serve God. Oh, really? You're just, you just ought to be thankful that God did not allow some bull or some horse or some deer to run through the woods and trample you down. Or God didn't allow the wind blow to knock you down. Because it's happened before. That when that tree is young, yes, it's full of life, but it's not very sturdy. And then what happens? The leaves fall off. It goes into a dormant season. And then all of a sudden spring comes around again and it grows on a new layer. Now that tree is a little bit taller than it used to be. And it's a little bit stronger than it used to be. I want you to think about that. Because with every, I mean just look at that. With every one of these cycles, every one of these tree rings that we see, every one of these cycles that we go through, God is making us stronger, mightier, and more fruitful. Think about, think about the amazing work of God in our life. If he said that we're going to be like a tree, then we are going to be like a tree. And God has to take us through these cycles to get us where we need to be in our Christian walk. If, if God can have patience with you, then you can have patience with God. Amen? So I just want you to think about that. And by the way, you can also look at a tree and, and, and through the rings there and tell the lean years. And, and you can see the lean years where there was very little water. And you can see the years where there was plenty of water. Because when there's plenty of water, I mean, that thing just puts it on. Amen? But when there's very little water, it reserves. And it holds on to what it has. It doesn't do a whole lot of growing. But it's still alive. And I want you to think about this. That even in the years and the times when there was very little rain in your life to nourish you. God still allowed you to stand. And he eventually brought the former and the latter rains in your life. Uh, I want you to think about this. Uh, the Bible talks about trees in Matthew chapter 3 verse 10. Here's John the Baptist talking and he says, Now also the axe is laid up unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And so I would ask you today, would you like to be one of those that is bearing fruit in your life? And let me give you something else too. Something that will hopefully knock you out of your self-righteousness. God never commanded you to produce fruit. He commands you to bear fruit. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. With an and, and if you want to be fruitful, you can do nothing without him. You cannot be fruitful without the vine nourishing the branches. You can't do it. You cannot produce. In fact, the fruit that you've produced in your life is corrupt. It's no good. God wants you to bear the fruit of righteousness in your life. And he will give you that. But if you will not bear fruit in your life, then the husbandman has every right to come in. And lay an axe to the roots of your tree of your life and bring it down. He did it. He cursed that tree that bore no fruit and he cursed it and it withered that day. Okay? So we're talking about blessings and cursings. I'm going to ask you again, do you want blessings in your life? Would you like to be blessed with salvation? Would you like to be blessed with a happy home? Would you like to be blessed with the strength that is in you and inside of your marriage, inside of your home? That when the storms of life blow, you don't fall down. You remain standing. By the way, I, I teach about this principle of uh, things that fall down and things that stand. And God commends us and he commands us and he blesses us and gives us the ability to stand rather than fall. There is going to come a falling away in the last days. And I want you to consider that God is bringing you through the cycles to strengthen you so that you have the ability to stand when everybody else falls. Now I'm going to show you, I want to show you these cycles in reality uh, in the scriptures. We're going to take our Bibles now. We're going to go to the book of Judges. And uh, I want us to start out, let me turn my Bible there very quickly. The book of Judges, 
chapter 2. If you're watching this on video, just take your Bible and turn there. And I want you to see, I want you to see something that God said. God had, told, God had told the Israelites that when they go into the promised land, that they're to remove all the enemies out of there. They get rid of the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Canaanites. And all, they get rid of them all. Clean that land out and don't leave anybody there. And that way that your land will be, it'll be safe, it'll be perfect, it'll be good. But that's not what they did. That is not what happened. And you and I both know that. And I'll tell you something, when you got saved... When you were born again, you said, never going to sin ever again, not going to do anything wrong, going to quit smoking, drinking, cussing, running around, I'm going to quit doing all those things, never going to think evil thoughts, I'm going to turn my television off, I'm going to do all those things, I'm never going never to be bothered by sin again. I'm going to get rid of it all. Yeah, right. It didn't happen. Okay? And you ask yourself, and, and what, we'll, what we'll start to think after a while is that I'm a failure at Christianity. I'm a failure. It's not working, okay? Now, I want to show you something. I want you, this, this is thus saith the Lord here. So I want you to watch this. Judges chapter 2, verse 11. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. Okay, this is after Joshua's done fought all the wars and they're settled in the land. Verse 12, and they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he delivered them into the hands of the spoilers that spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said and as the Lord had sworn unto them. And they were greatly distressed. You ever been there? Verse 16, nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges. Nevertheless, nevertheless, that's God being merciful to his people that have turned their backs on him. That's God being merciful. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way uh, which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. And they ceased not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he said, now listen to what God said here. Because that this people have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not a hearken unto, he said, my people. He's not talking to the heathens. He said, my people. Because my people um, have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice, I also will not henceforth drive out. Who does the driving out? God does. I will not Henceforth drive out any from before them uh, of, of the nations which Joshua left when he died. That through them I may prove Israel. Has, does God, when we are proved, who's God proving it to? Is he proving it to God? God knows the outcome. He already knows how things are going to turn out in your life. So who's God proving it to? you. He's showing you how you are through the failures, the disobedience. God is showing you who you who really, you know why God shows you who you are? So he can then reveal to you who he is. Okay. Cause remember it's all about him anyway. Okay. So watch this that through them, I may prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did it or did keep it or not. Therefore, the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. Now I want you to look in chapter 3, verse 1. God's going to watch this. this. When God showed me this, man, I tell you what, I just wept. I wept when God showed me this. And these are the nations which the Lord, who left them there? God did. To prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. I want you to get this. 
It is known in our country that the greatest generation in, the, in, in our lifetime is dying off. The greatest generation in our lifetime was that generation that went through and fought during World War II. These were men that knew the cost of liberty and freedom in this country. No wonder we are so far away from that in our country. See, remember, we go in cycles, even in our country. No wonder we are so far away from that in our country. Is that that generation that they knew the value of a penny. They knew the value of a penny. They never threw anything away. They kept, I mean, your, your grandpa kept everything he ever laid his hands on. Okay? Not because he was obsessive compulsive either. It's just because he grew up in a generation where you didn't have anything. And you definitely didn't throw anything away. But it was that generation that knew the wars and knew that they had fought and seen their brothers spill their blood and their guts all over the battlefield. And they knew the cost of freedom. And they said it was precious to them. And they would never do anything to have the freedoms taken away from them. But look at where we're at right now. Okay? But in a Christian's life, you think about this. Joshua was a warrior. And Joshua had one purpose. When he led Israel into the promised land... It was kill and take no prisoners. Okay? That's who Joshua was and that's who the warriors of his day was. They'd been wandering around in the wilderness and they finally got to the land and they said, Get out! Get out! I got my sword in my hand. You get out and, I'm, and I'll kill you. And that was the warrior generation. They fought and spilled their guts and blood all over the place to get the land that they had. But what happened? That generation died off. And the children who were born in the promised land had never seen war. They had never seen a battle. And they didn't know how to fight. And God said, I'm going to leave these nations in here. Why? Number one, to prove you. But number two, I'm going to teach you how to fight. Okay? Man, when I read that, I mean the Holy Ghost, Mike, there's a reason why you are the way you are. Number one, you are stubborn. Amen, I'm stubborn. But number two, Mike, I'm teaching you how to fight. I see my life right now as being in boot camp, okay? I'm in, I'm in God's paramilitary organization. Boy, let that get out on YouTube. I'm in God's paramilitary organization. I'm, I'm one of his fighters, one of his warriors. And God's got me in training right now. He is teaching my hands to know war, as David said. He's teaching my fingers to fight. How did David know how to fight Goliath? He fought a lion and a bear. And he said, this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. So God not only gifted him with his grace and giving him the ability to win that battle against Goliath. But God had also trained him. So that David knew how to not it wasn't that he didn't know how to he, it wasn't that David was not afraid it's that just that David knew how to get that fear out of the way to go take care of business but God said only that the generations of the children of Israel verse 2 might know to teach them war at the least such as before knew nothing thereof and so we're going to go just very quickly we're going to go through the book of Judges and I'm going to read some scriptures we're going to put them up on the screen for you uh, Judges chapter 3. So here they are in the land and they're supposed to be righteous, but they're not. And they fall into sin. They fall into pride. And God brings them down. Judges chapter 3 verse 7. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam and the groves. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he sold them into the hand of Chushan Rishon Theim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Chushan Rishon Theim eight years. But then look in verse 9. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, they didn't invoke God by saying some sacred name. Amen. Okay. They cried unto the Lord and the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. So God raised up a savior. They cried unto the God, God, and God sent them a savior. Now watch this. Verse 11. And the land had rest 40 years and Othniel, the son of Kenaz died. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Now look at verse 30. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel and the land had rest fourscore years. So here they are resting again. 
And after him was Shamgar the son of Anath, which slew the Philistines 600 men with an ox goat, and he also delivered Israel. Now look at chapter 4, verse 1. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, they reigned, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in Herosheth of the Gentiles. So here they are right back down again. They turned their back on God. They got full of pride. The judge died. The judge is a picture of the Bible. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible will die in our lives. There will be times we won't read it or we'll go through the motions of reading it, but we're not getting anything out of it. And so that's what that judge represents. Anyway, so then now they're down low again. So look at verse 3, chapter 4. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. Look at Judges chapter 6, verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. Verse 7. And it came to pass, when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth from the house of bondage. You know what that prophet was going to tell them? He was telling them, don't worry, God's going to bring you back out again. Because that's who God is. That is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of cycles, the God of seasons, the God of the things that he's doing in our life. God's going to bring you back out again. And I want to tell you something. We can't make, we, we, you know, we often tell ourselves, well, you know, if I just quit, quit sinning and quit doing everything, then things will get better. The truth of it is, we cry unto the Lord first, and He delivers us from sin. We don't deliver ourselves. So get this. I mean, I hope all this is sinking into you. Judges chapter 8, verse 33. And it came to pass, as soon as Gideon was dead, that children of Israel turned again, and went a-whoring after Balaam, and made Baal Bereth their god. And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God, who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side. And then look at Judges chapter 10, verse 1. And after Abimelech, there arose to defend Israel Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. And he dwelt in Shamir in Mount Ephraim. And he judged Israel twenty and three years and died and was buried in Shamir. And after him arose Jair, a Gileadite, and judged Israel twenty and two years. And then look at verse 5. And Jair died and was buried in Canaan. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And served Balaam and Ashtaroth and the gods of Syria and the gods of Zidon, the gods of Moab, and the gods of the children of Ammon and the gods of the Philistines and forsook the Lord and served not him. You might say, well, that's Israel and they didn't have Christ. I'm saying to you today that if you don't recognize this pattern in your own life, you're being deceived. You've deceived yourself. The truth of it is, people, we're not as good as what we what we intend to be. I, I am not as good as what you may think I am watching on this camera or sitting here in this church. I am not as good as you think I am. I had, a, I had a dear friend of mine, a pastor in the ministry, and I just really looked up to him. And, and he perceived how I was thinking about him. And he looked me right in the eye and he said, Mike, he said, I'm not who you think I am. And immediately God began to deal with me about that. I recognized that this pastor friend of mine was the same kind of sinner that I was. We are, we are not saved and staying saved by the power of our own fruitfulness and our own works. God, remember, Christianity is not about what we're doing for God, but about what God is doing in us. That way, that way, all the glory goes to him and not to us. By the way, I want to go back to this Psalm 1 thing. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Have you ever walked in the counsel of the ungodly? Yes. Number two, nor standeth in the way of the sinners. You ever went where sinners went? Yes. Number three, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Have you ever been mad at the sermon? You ever didn't want to go to church? Yes. So you know what? You're not the man that's being talked about in Psalm chapter 1. Guess who is? Christ. And when we live and abide in Christ, then we receive of the blessings that only Christ has the right to receive. Since we are in Christ. God had decided that... He he was going to have a boat floating on top of the floodwaters, whether Noah and his family went in or not. Okay, that boat, once it was built, was going to float. And as long as Noah was inside of that ark, Noah floated along with the boat. The boat, the ark, was Christ. So I want you to think about this, that pattern. In fact, probably there was, I think there was like 15 different judges in the book of Judges. And 15 different times, Moses was one before that, and then Samuel was one after that. 
So 17 times Israel went in this cycle that we can see over and over again, up and down, up and down, up and down. So I want you to picture this as a picture of your life. And no, we get to a place in our life where we weep and we say, God, I never, God, please, no, 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 I don't want to sin anymore. God, I don't want to. Okay, and just remember that God has got everything in his hand. I want to go back to this water cycle now. And uh, I want to look at this verse, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 7. The Bible says, all the rivers run into the sea, and yet the sea is not full. Under the place from which the rivers came, thither they return again. Now, remember, Solomon is wise. He's a very wise man. God had given him wisdom. Too bad he didn't use it on his own life. Amen. But God had given him wisdom. And Solomon saw things that people had not really thought about before. In fact, it took years for science to figure out that there was a cycle to, to water in, in the world. Why weren't, why, how come if the rivers run into the ocean, how come they're not full? Okay, I mean, I live close to the Mississippi River. And the Mississippi River in our area is huge. But that thing gets bigger and broader as it moves downstream. By the time it gets to New Orleans, I mean, that thing is, that thing is deep and wide and wrought, just massive amounts of water running into it. Well... How come the Gulf of Mexico doesn't overflow the banks and then the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, India, how come they don't overflow the banks? It's because God said the sea is not full. Okay, the rivers run into the sea, but it's not full. Take a look, here's a picture of the water cycle right here. Water runs into the ocean and then that water, watch this now, is picked up. It's picked up. And we're going to talk about that here in a second. Okay, it's picked up transferred into the upper atmosphere and it forms clouds and the clouds pour rain and snow upon the mountains and upon the valleys and the valleys fill up and they flood and the mountains get full of snow and they hold that snow all winter long and then the seasons come along and that snow begins to melt and begins to flood those rivers again and those rivers pour right back down into a main river source like the Mississippi River and then they run right back into the ocean and it happens all over again. How come the Mississippi River, if it's running, how come it doesn't run out? It's because of the water cycles, because of what God is doing uh, inside of nature. And if you stop and think about this, everything in God's creation has cycles. The, the day cycle, the night cycle, the, the stars in the, in the, in the heavens, they, have, they go in cycles. We see certain stars at some time of the year and certain stars at other times of the year. Uh, the moon has cycles. A, a woman has cycles in her body. Okay, we have cycles. Uh, our blood cycles through our body. It circulates as the and blood is life. Okay, and this is our life. Our blood circulates from our heart. Our heart takes the blood and pumps it through the lungs where it's full of the spirit, oxygen. Get it? I love it. And it is oxygenated, and the blood then goes out to all the members of the body. That's the church. And it gives life unto the members. But when the members draw on that oxygen that is in that blood, that blood then becomes oxygen depleted. Where does it go? Is it a dead end road? No. Because the blood then turns and circulates back into the lungs so it can be oxygenated again. And oh, I love this because our heart is a four-chamber heart, and that's a picture of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's a picture of the spiritual realm of God's way, the gospel. The gospel is what, is what makes everything work inside the body, and it's in cycles. So I want you to think about, and just think about, it, just practically everything in the world that God created has a cycle of some kind to it, all right? So now I want you to think about this. And I want you to think about the sea for a minute. We're going to start out in the ocean. And I want you to think about the ocean or the sea. The Bible calls it the deep. Okay? There is nothing in this world that is lower than the ocean. There's nothing deeper than the sea. So when we think of things that are deep, remember Jonah ended up in the deep. And he wanted God to bring him out of it. In fact, Jonah referred to it. As hell, and we're going to read that here in a little bit. But the deep is where we start out. When we, when we get saved, we are deep in sin. We are deep in the pits. I mean, we belong in the pits of hell. Our soul is, is buried and, and we are dead. It's like we're in a grave. We are, the Bible says we are dead in trespasses and sin. So what happens is, is that we are down low in the deep. Psalm chapter 68 verse 22. 
The Lord said, I will bring again from Bashan, and I, I will bring my people again from the depths of the sea. Where does God save us from? Does God save us from the mountaintop? No. God saves us from down in the pit, down in the sea, down in the deep where we are. Okay? Now watch this. I See, I like this because, I mean, everything fits together with this. Seawater is the same salinity factor as uterine water or water that's inside a woman's womb. So think about this as being born again. Think about it as being birth, okay? Because that's what God's doing. Whenever he brings people out of the sea, he's bringing them out of the sea, the salt water, the womb. He is birthing them, and that's the whole image of the sea, okay? So he says, I will bring my people again from the depths of the sea. That's where you were when you got saved. So here, watch this now. Isaiah 57, 20. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. When you were lost in sins, you were restless. You were troubled in your... So what happened is, is that the Holy Ghost of God, the wind, started bearing down on your soul. And all of a sudden, sins that were easy for you to commit and sins that were easy for you to do. And you were delighting in wickedness and you were delighting in sin. All of a sudden, the Holy Ghost of God, the wind is bearing down on your soul and it's troubling your heart and it's making you restless and you cannot sleep and you cannot, I mean, you just can't, can't do anything. And what God's doing, God's troubling the sea so he can bring you out of it. Jonah chapter 2 verse 1, as Jesus said, as Jonah was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. By the way, I will tell you that I believe the story of Jonah was real. Amen? That, I heard these scholars that talk about, say, well, you know, Jonah probably wasn't real, but it's a good story. We could get something from it. Listen, if Jonah wasn't real, then Christ was lying through his teeth. As Jonah was in the whale's belly three days. Now watch this. Here's what Jonah said. After the whale had swallowed him and taken him down to the depths of the sea, here's what Jonah said. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of my infliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell. Cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Remember, remember what God was always having to do with Israel. They, he brought them down low, and what, how, is it that God, how is it that God sent them a Savior? They cried. They cried unto him, and he was there three days and three nights, and number three is the number for resurrection. Okay, you were alive, you died, now you're being resurrected again. Okay, for thou hast cast me into the deep, into the midst of the seas, and the floods can pass me about, all thy billows and thy waves pass me over. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. You know, as pastor, I can tell, I can tell who the devil's just beating up. You know why? They're not in church. They skip out one service here and one service there, and then directly it gets easier, and all of a sudden, they're just not there anymore. And but I'm going to tell you something, when, when the sin starts troubling you and the Holy Ghost starts bearing down on your soul, you know what happens? You start looking back to the church again. You want to get back in church. We've have, we have people who, have, who grew up in church and got out. And they got to a place in their life where they said, you know what? We need to be in church again. And they show up. You know why? Because the Holy Ghost began to bear down on their soul. This is the beginning of the cycle that God is bringing us to. All right, now think about this, okay? Look at this picture now again of the ocean and how this, how this uh, water ends up from the ocean into the upper atmosphere. How does that happen? Two things are working together. Okay, two things, Old Testament, New Testament. See, when you see two, that's what you think of. Two witnesses, two things are working together to bring a soul out of the ocean, to bring water out of the ocean. Number one, the wind. The winds are blowing, but number two, the sun is shining. And who is the sun? Okay, the, Malachi chapter 4 verse 2 says, But unto you that fear my name shall the sun, capital S-U-N, of righteousness, arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. So think about this. The sun and the wind. The sun is Christ, the word of God, giving light into our souls. And the, and the Holy Ghost is the wind of God stirring up the waters. And that wind and that sun is causing that water to evaporate. Okay? Now I want you to get this. Because when water is in the sea and it starts out on this journey, you cannot, you cannot see one droplet of water in evaporation. It is so tiny, it is like a molecule at a time it's picking up. And it starts out very, very, very small. 
But as time goes, it gets bigger, and we're going to see that, okay? So anyway, the sun and the wind working together. This is a picture of the Lord working in our lives. And he's, what he's doing, he's bringing us up out of the sea. He's bringing us up out of hell. He's bringing us up out of the, the turmoil and the distress and the trouble that we were in. God is doing that for us in our lives, okay? So watch this now. Um, the wind is a, all this is a picture of the word of God. Job chapter 38 verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said. Job chapter 40 verse 6. Then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind and said. Okay, so I want you to, I want you to get this idea. That as God pulls us out. Watch this now. Here we go. As God pulls us out. He pulls us up together in heavenly places. And we are sitting together with other saints whom God has also pulled out. Amen? Now I like this, okay? All of a sudden, we're up there with, with all the other water droplets that have been picked up, and we're, boy, we're, we're just being brought up, okay? Now get this picture, because these, this whirlwind, this, this, and here's this picture of his hurricane here. God speaks, and we talked about this in our DNA video, God speaks out of the whirlwind. So what does that mean? That now God has brought you to a place where he's not only lifted you up, but God's going to use you to be a, a witness and a testimony to somebody else's life. Now I want you to think about this because ultimately we're looking at wanting to bear fruit in our life and be, have, a, have an effect in, in our life for other people. People call me on the phone or they write emails to me and say, Pastor Mike, you're such a blessing. Man, you're such a blessing. And I, I don't say, well, of course I am. Bless God. You know what I say to them? I've been a curse before to people. I've been a curse to myself. I've been a curse to my family. I've been a curse to my church. I've been a curse to people. I've been a curse to people long enough. I want to be a blessing. And so here's what happens. God gathers all those water droplets up in the air and they're there. And God's, hey, watch this. God's going to speak out of them. He's going to speak through them. God's going to speak through the clouds. And his glory is going to be there. Acts chapter 2 verse 2. And then suddenly there came a sound from heaven... As of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. I mean think about this now. Here's the wind. Here's the sun. Picking us all up. And now we're clouds. And God's wanting to speak through us. And on the day of Pentecost. When this rushing mighty wind was sounded. And by the way. Going back to this hurricane deal. Where, does, where do hurricanes get the massive amount of rain. That they have in them. You know what that happens. The wind is picking that rain up. From those warm waters. And, that, and what causes the waters to be warm? The sun. This is how it's working. Okay. And so God picks us up. And on the day of Pentecost. When they heard that sound. All of a sudden right then and there. The Holy Ghost came upon them. And they began to preach in other tongues. Other languages. So that people could understand them. Not unsyllabic tongues. Where they just jabber their lips together. And say oh this is the Holy Ghost. That's not true. Because they were preaching. Why? So that the word of God would go forth for them into the hearts and the ears and the hearing and the understanding of people that were there so they would, they would be saved. They all heard them speak the word of God in their life. I want you to think about now God's, God's got us in our church now and God's using us. He's a blessing. Or in our home. Our homes now can be a blessing and we're teaching the word of God, uh, teaching the word of God to our wives or our husbands or our children or our grandchildren. God's using us again to be a voice and a mouthpiece for the word of God. Okay, so watch this now. We're, we're, we're going to watch this because in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25, he said, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the what? The day approaching. God is gathering his people together and so much the more as we see these days approaching in these lives, we need to stick together. You don't notice if God picks moisture up from the atmosphere, from, from the ocean, we walk outside and we feel that it's kind of humid. We know that there's a lot of moisture in the air, but we don't see it. We don't see the evidence of it. And, and it's not until God begins to draw them all together and group them together do we see that God has exalted his church in heavenly places. Picture that. So when, 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 listen, if misery loves company, so should victory. Amen. If we're in victory, then we should love the company and the fellowship and the blessing of other people. So what happens is when you get saved, all of a sudden God, God begins to lift you up. But what he does is he puts you in a congregation of like-minded believers who are going to worship God the way that the way the Bible tells them to worship. That's what happens in a normal 
Christian's life. And you go around seeing all these people say, well, you know, I'm just as good a Christian as anybody in that church. Oh, I don't go to church. Of course, you don't have to be a Christian to go to church. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I'm telling you that even if you home church, you get yourself around a people, a group of people that are godly, that are worshiping the Lord, that love the Lord, it is the natural inclination of people to be drawn together, to assemble together like clouds, to be a witness of the glory. Now watch this. I'm saying all this for a reason. Exodus 16, I want you to get this picture. We talked about this in our video on the clouds, but I'm going to use it in a little bit different fashion because the Word of God is so deep. Exodus chapter 16, 66 chapter of the Bible. That's the number of books in the Bible. And it says, And it came to pass, as Aaron spoke unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Look at Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 28. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spoke. A congregation, let me, let me keep reading here, Luke chapter 21 and verse 27, And when they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Hebrews 12, 1, Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. This is what we are intended to be as Christians. God saved us. He brought us out of the sea. He brought us out of drowning in the pit. And he lifted us up. And God doesn't want us to just sit there and enjoy that. And say, boy, this was nice. Can't wait to go to heaven. God says, I, I anticipate that you people will get together. And my glory. Jesus said, now watch this. Jesus said, where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. He didn't say just one. No man in Christianity is an island, okay? God intends for at least two people to get together and fellowship so that he can be in the midst of them. The glory of the Lord will shine out of a home, a family, a marriage. That's two. A marriage, children. He'll shine out of a church congregation. Doesn't matter how small. I don't care if you've got four people going to your church. God will shine out of that church. One of the blessings that God has given us here in this church is that we run about 40, 50 people. Something, it's winter time now, so usually it's about 30, 35 or 40, especially when the weather gets bad. But yet the glory of God shines out of this church because that's the design of God. And he wants to speak. We are the cloud of witnesses. All right. Okay. Now, we're going to, I love this because now that we're clouds, here's what happens. We get up, when we get up here, Invariably what happens is we get full of pride. We get full of the pride of what we're doing. We get full of the pride of how, how well, our marriage is so holy. Why people would just kill to be married like we are. That's how we get. It's my nature and I bet it's your nature too. If not, then maybe I'm just preaching this message for myself and it doesn't really mean anything to you. But I'm telling you that when we get high and lofty, we get proud. Lucifer. What happened to him? Pride was found in his heart. And where was he? He was high and lifted up. He was the anointed cherub that covereth. And how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? And when we have pride in us, and everybody says, well... You know, I get up there, but at least I'm not smoking and drinking and committing adultery and I'm not telling dirty jokes and I'm not spitting tobacco and I'm not doing all these things. Yeah, but this the fact that you're telling about everything that you're not doing is indicative of the pride that you won't tell about. In fact, I want to share this with you and I want you to listen to this. Three groups of sins. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. I would much rather be guilty in a small way of those than to be full of pride because God resisteth the proud but he gives grace to the humble and I'd rather have God chasing and whoop the fire out of me because I lusted with my eyes or I lusted with my flesh anything but I don't want pride in my life but it invariably happens we get full of pride and because pride goeth before 
destruction and haughtiness before a fall, the Bible says. So here's what happens. We're up there and boy, we're the clouds. And uh, we, we are just, we're just floating around and we're just enjoying life. You know, you get times in the ministry where, boy, you think nothing's going to happen. Boy, we're just going to keep on growing. We're just going to keep on growing. We're added 20 in Sunday school last week. We're gonna, we got it in our plan to add another 50 more. Boy, we're just going to keep on growing until we got 5,000 people in our church. Bless God. That way you can get to the preacher's meeting and tell them, whoa, I tell you what, we're bringing them in. That's pride. What happens when two preachers get together? First thing out of their mouth, how's your church? Let me tell you about what's going on, okay? And even if it's bad, we always say, well, I was doing pretty good. We get so full of pride in the things that we think that we're doing, and we forgot, we forgot that we didn't lift ourselves up out of the pit. God did. And so we're so full of pride, and I want you to look at this now, because we're going to go to another place in Scripture, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 12. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and what? Lofty. How do we, how, what do we say about clouds? Look at the loftiness, loft, look at the loftiness of those clouds. They are aloft. They're way up in the air. And here's what God says. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one. He didn't say, well, you know, except my people. You know, if they're, if they're saved, I, I can't do this to them. That's not what he said. In fact, I will tell you that God has a moral and legal obligation to bring us down first before he does the rest of the world. Why? Because judgment begins at the house of God first. And so he says, for the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty and upon everyone that is lifted up and he shall be brought low. Remember, you said you wanted to be a blessing. You said you wanted to be blessed and you said you wanted to be a blessing. You said you wanted the fruit of the Spirit in your life and the fruit of the Spirit is not rolling around on the floor and barking like a dog and speaking in tongues and being slain in the Spirit. That is not the evidence of a Spirit-filled life. The evidence of a Spirit-filled life is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and all those things, those nine things that Paul said in Galatians, that is the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And you said you wanted to be fruitful in God's kingdom. He's going to bring you down to do it. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 15. And the mean man shall be brought down. Can I say this? You know what happens? You know what happens when we get proud? We get mean. We got mean, we got mean preachers behind pulpits that are just being mean because they're so full of pride. Bless God, we got standards. And they, and they bark against everybody else bragging on what I am and knocking down what everybody else is. And we get, and I know this, we get mean about it. And the mean man shall be brought down and the mighty man shall be humbled. And the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. You say, well, Pastor Mike, I'm following you, but I just, I, well, I still think that uh, when we're righteous and when we're saved in Christ, we never have these problems ever again. The Bible says a just man falls seven times. He was up. And he fell. He was up and he fell. That's the testimony of the scriptures. Okay. Isaiah 26, 5. For he bringeth down them that dwell on high. The lofty city he layeth it low. And he layeth it low even to the ground. He bringeth it even to the dust. Think about this. Think about what God's trying to teach us. I want to tell you something. I, 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 I hate I hate with a passion the immorality that exists in this country. But I will tell you that part of it lies in the fact that the American church is too proud and too cocky with this world. Too much money, too much TV time, too much of everything has made the American church. The church in this country has been blessed and now it needs to be brought low. And God is the one who has the right to do that. And he is going to do that. So I want you to think about this, okay? Now, watch this. We can never, as clouds, we can, we can never be a blessing to Christ so long as we remain in the air. In fact, in fact, as clouds, we have a tendency, the longer we stay up there, the more we gather together, we have a tendency to block out the sunlight. We have a tendency to get in the way. Boy, this is so deep, isn't it? We have a tendency to get in God's way. And the only way that we as clouds can be a blessing 
to anybody is to be brought back down. Now, how does God do that? God does that through rain. And I want to get to rain in a minute, but I want to show you, I want to show you how to identify the false prophets of the last days. Okay. Um, Jude chapter one, and we're doing this on our, on our, uh, on a Bible study. Uh, we're talking about the false prophets. He said, these are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water. Carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. See how everything's coming together now? He said these false prophets of the last days are clouds without water. Now I'm going to show you a verse that'll, that'll knock your hat in a creek when you see this. Okay? I want to show you what these clouds without water really are. Proverbs 25, 14. Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. Benny Hinn going around going on everybody and them falling down or acting like they're falling down. It is a false gift. He does not have that. And the people that are falling down are going along with the masquerade with him. These people are going around. Oh, I've got the gift of prophecy. Oh, God, show me this about your life. You need to leave your wife because she's a witch and you need to marry somebody else. The false prophets are running around through the churches. They're going around. They're bragging about false gifts that they do not have. And you know what they are? They're clouds without water. They are standing in the way of the true gospel of Jesus. Jesus Christ. Is that how you want to be? I don't. Because I've stood in the way before. And I don't want to get in God's way ever again. So now God's, God's going to let us be a blessing. All right. Are you ready? for? I'm just smiling. I love this. God's going to let us be a blessing. So the clouds gather and all of a sudden they get, get so heavy that the rain starts coming down. Notice what the Bible says. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse two through, verses 2 through 3. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. Oh, praise the Lord. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. Think about that. God said he wants his doctrine, which is the gospel. He wants his doctrine to spread throughout the, all the earth and bless the earth. So he said, my doctrine shall distew as the, as the dew and as the rain. It's going to drop down a rain, as the rain upon the tender herb. You know why? Because now, watch this, even in you coming down, you're being blessing to a young Christian, to someone who's tender in Christ. See how it works? Think about all the people in your life That as, and you didn't see it that way. You didn't see them as coming down, but that's what was happening. And all the people in your life that have been a spiritual blessing to you all the days of your life that have helped you grow as a Christian. I have people like that in my life. And I used to think, boy, they're just clouds. They're up all the time. And I didn't realize. That pastor friend told me, Mike, I'm not who you think I am. He was telling me, Mike, the only way I can be a blessing to you is if I'm on my way, on my way back down. And God shows me this over and over and over again. That it's the only way that I can be a blessing to anybody. It's for God to bring it back. And he's going to be a blessing. Now these young Christians now. They need to see the truthfulness in our lives. And not the phony fakeness that we put forth as we're spiritual. These young Christians and these people newly saved. And I'll tell you even lost people. They need to know that church people are not perfect. They need to see us humbled. Lamentations chapter 2 verse 18. Their heart cried unto the Lord, O wall of the daughter of Zion, let tears run down like a river day and night. Give thyself no rest, let not the apple of thine eye cease. Now look at Psalm 126 verse 5. They that sow in tears shall reap Enjoy. Now remember, this is about the fruitfulness of our life. This is about what we want God to do. And God equates this, this rain and his doctrine distilling like the dew and like the rain. He equates it as our tears. So what happens is we get this point of pride in us. And God says, now I can't use you now. You're in the way. So all of a sudden he starts bringing us down. He begins to humble us. And I'll tell you something. When you get humbled enough, when you get humbled enough, you'll weep. You may not do it in front of everybody. You may not have big, some big snot sling and cry in front of the whole church. But when you get humbled, you will weep. You'll cry. 
And God starts, God says, now I can use you because you're humble. And I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this from the scriptures and I will tell you this from personal experience. The best way for God to humble us is to humiliate us. When we start thinking more of ourselves than we ought, God will, and he will do it in a discreet manner. First, God will reveal the shamefulness of ourselves to ourselves. And if that don't work, then God will send a witness our way and reveal it to us. And if that don't work, then he'll send two witnesses. Then if that doesn't work, he'll bring us before the church. Amen. But I will tell you the best way to God for, for, for God to hum humble us is that he has to humiliate us. And all of a sudden we have the shame of our pride upon us. Where we had pride, now we have shame. But God is bringing us down. And while it doesn't look like we're triumphing in Christ, we are. Paul said, now thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph. Now Paul said that everything that happens in our life is God triumphing in us. And I know sometimes in the mess and the disasters of our lives that we see ourselves in, we don't see the triumphing in it. It looks like we're defeated. It looks like we're broken. It looks like we are torn apart. It looks like God has practically destroyed our lives. But what God's doing, God's causing us the tears to run down like rivers and our tears would be falling as rain. And they that sow in tears, there's a cycle, shall reap in joy. And then we sow in tears and then we reap in joy and we sow in tears and we reap in joy. I tell you, you, if you've not already figured it out, God saved my life with this. I had gotten to a point in my life, I was a miserable failure. And I said, God, I can't serve you. I, have, I can't do it. God said, that's exactly what I wanted to hear out of you. Because I spent years in self-righteousness, self-determination, self-motivation. I spent years that way in my Christian walk thinking that it was up to me, it was up to me, it was up to me. And God said, now that I've heard what I want to hear, now I can work through you. And so God began to sow through my tears. Began to sow the seeds of righteousness in my life. He began to sow the seeds of the harvest that God wanted to do in my life and in my family. And through our church and through our ministry, God began to do that. I'm here today as a product of these rings in a tree and of these cycles in my life. And I'm thankful that he showed me this. Now, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 36. Then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel, that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk and give rain upon the land which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. You need to understand that rain is a symbol of the blessing of life. Rain is a symbol when it, when, when, it, when it harvest time, when planting time comes around, it needs to rain. When harvest time comes around, it needs to rain. And I will tell you something, in the dry and barren wildernesses of our lives or other people's lives, they need to see in us the rain coming out, down of, out of our lives and us being a blessing to them. I'll tell you what, when someone is in our church, when someone comes down and they're being broken, God's breaking them on the altar and they're being broken before God. I see the tears falling down and that is a blessing to people and it encourages other people. Hey, if God can, God can deal with them, he can deal with me. Job chapter five, verse 10, who giveth rain upon the earth and sendeth water upon the fields. And so here's what happens. God sends this rain down and it's like a picture of our tears and we begin to cry and we begin to mourn. We begin to weep. And I want you to think about, we're going to go back to Matthew chapter five here in a minute, but all of a sudden what happens to all that rain and all that snow? It lays on the ground. And here this year, we've had, I mean, we've had so much snow and rain. And the ground's just saturated. And any time it rains now, it immediately runs off the top of the ground and immediately goes where? Into those old dry creeks. You know, those ones out behind your house that they only run when the rain comes. Okay? Those dry creeks and those and, and those areas, and that water runs down into those dry creeks, and it fills those creeks. I used to run down, every time we'd have a good heavy rain, I used to run down the woods behind my house when I was a kid, just to watch the creek rise, just to watch that creek. And, and when it didn't rain, there was no water in that creek ever, and uh, except for in little pools, which are stagnant water, which is where all the crud of our life is, and we need some running water, amen? 
But anyway, used to run down there and watch them creeks rise up. And that's what happens. And now all of a sudden we're a blessing. Now all of a sudden we're a river, we're a stream. Psalm chapter 46 verse 4, there is a river... The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. And God is showing us that rivers are a blessing. Towns that sprung up in our country sprung up around, around rivers and, and water areas, but mainly around rivers. St. Louis is the town that it is because it was a river port. It, it grew up around the river. And so rivers are a blessing. But just remember what God showed me. What God showed me out there sitting in that deer wood several years ago, God said, look at that river now, Mike. And I said, yeah. He said, where is it? And I said, it's low. And I said, it's getting lower all the time. So now we're going back down. But I want you to think about it. Several years ago, and several of you have requested a copy of this, I preached a message called Where Dragons Live. And if you just study, the dragon is the devil. And you just study, the, you just study dragons in the Bible, you will find out that dragons love to live in a barren wasteland. Dragons love to live in areas of people's lives where there is no water. Watch this now, Isaiah chapter 35, verse 6. Then shall the lame man leap as in heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall, shall sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. Why? Because God lets you be a blessing to someone else's life in their wilderness time of their life. And God lets you pour down blessings in their life. And verse 7, And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of dragons where each lay shall grass, shall be grass with reeds and rushes, and an highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. And the unclean shall not pass over, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. The ble the, I'll tell you what, you want to get rid of the dragons? Let the rains come down and fill up the streams. Amen. Let God fill up that parched ground of your life uh, with a little rainwater. And I promise you, I promise you, the devil cannot, he cannot handle water. Okay. By the way, hell is a place with no water. Okay. So he cannot handle water. So I want you to think about this. Now here, that's that cycle. Now, so what happens is, <coughs> is that, that, that water is getting lower all the time. And then it runs down into the ocean. And there we are again, back down in the deep, back down in the valley, back down where we can't see light, in depression, in financial misery, in marital misery, in, in church misery. I mean, it's just, it's there. It happens, it happens, it happens. Now, I will tell you. That though not obviously apparent in some people's lives, I will tell you that some people's cycles go faster or slower than others. That's the way of nature. Not everybody is the same in this deal, but everybody goes through these cycles. Okay? Just as there are quick cycles like the cycles of a minute or an hour or a day, there are slow cycles like the cycles of a year or the cycle of the, of the planets and so on. There are slow cycles. And not everybody's the same. Okay? But now God's, God's showing we're down deep again and we need help and we cry out unto the Lord and all of a sudden the wind starts to blow and the sun starts shining and he lifts us right back out and there we are all over again. Now we're a blessing again. I want us to go back to Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to show you this very quickly and then, then we're going to close. I want you to look at this because here we see these cycles in the Beatitudes, the, the eight, and yet there's nine. Eight is a number for new life and new beginning. Nine is a number for fruit bearing. <clears throat> so I want you to watch this. So now we're going to start back down in the ocean again, okay? And in Matthew chapter five, this is, a per, this is a picture of how God deals with us when we get saved and how, how he keeps us in our salvation life experience. Matthew chapter five, verse three, blessed are the what? He didn't say blessed are the rich. He said blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God says, if you're poor in spirit. Now, here's what happened. God, when you were a sinner, God had to bankrupt your life. You were spiritually bankrupt. God broke the bank in your life. You were out writing checks in sin that your flesh could not cash. You had, you had accrued a sin debt. That, that's, that is why hell and the lake of fire is Forever. Don't let anybody tell you that it's not. It is forever because in eternity you will not be able to pay off the debt 
of sin that you have accrued in your life. You are poor in your spirit. You are spiritually bankrupt before God. And I want to tell you something. You know how you got saved? You got saved upon the recognition that you were, that, that you were broke before God and you had nothing in you whatsoever and you, you had nothing. The, the old psalm says, uh, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. When you come to Jesus Christ, you come empty. You know what's happened in a lot of churches? People come, come into church and say, well, well, you know, boy, God wants me. God wants me because I can do things for him. They're not saved. They're not saved. You're not saved. God will not bless you until you're broken, until you're a poor in spirit, until he breaks the bank. So that's, that's the first part. The second part is, blessed are they that mourn. For they shall be comforted. Mourning. We're weeping because when we mourn, things are dead. And we are in mourning. We're seeing the deadness of our life. We're seeing the deadness of our marriage. We're seeing the deadness, pastors and, and leaders. We're seeing the deadness that is in our church. And we're mourning. We're wanting to see souls saved. We're wanting to see God to do a good work. And we're mourning over those things. And God says, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The word comfort is a Holy Ghost term. It is he, Jesus said, the comforter shall come. So watch this. We're broken in spirit. We are poor in spirit. We cannot pay our debt. And we're mourning over that. And what does God do for us? He sends us the Holy Spirit to comfort us. Somebody say amen. So now watch this. Then he says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now it doesn't say blessed are the weak. It said blessed are the meek. The meek meekness is defined in different ways. Some say that it's yielding your rights. When we are high and lofty and proud, we think we have a right to everything. In America, we think that we have a right to everything under the sun. We think we have a right to health care. We think we have a right to government benefits. We think we have a right to this and a right to that. And I want to tell you something that when you get saved, you don't think you have a right anymore to anything. The only thing that you're glad for is that the fact that you're not going to hell. The older I get, the longer I serve Christ and the more that he means to me, the le I tell you what, the more I don't think I deserve to have a big church. The more I don't think that I, I, don't, I don't deserve to have a, a full belly every day. I tell you what, I don't deserve anything but hell and I deserve it hot and yet Christ saved me. And so God needs to put a little meekness in our life and he's brought us down and he's humbled us so that even if people around us are taking everything in the world, we say that's okay. You say, I don't believe that brother Mike. Well, let me tell you about a story by the name of Abraham. A man by the name of Abraham. The Bible said Abraham and Lot's herdsmen strove together. And Abraham had given Lot everything. He had sort of adopted him. And he had given Lot everything that he had. And all of a sudden Lot's, Lot's uh, deal began to increase. And Abraham's deal began to increase. And the herdsmen began to fight over the grasses and the plains and the well water and everything else. And they began to fight. And Lot went to Abraham and, and said, what are we going to do about this? And, Abraham, and now Abraham exhibited meekness. Because what Abraham said was, Lot... You take, you take whatever you want. If you choose this way, I'm going to go this way. And Lot, if you go this way, then I'm going to go this way. Whichever one you want. And the Bible says that Lot chose the well-watered plains of Sodom. He was choosing there where the plains were, where the waters were, and the markets were. Because Lot says, you know what? If there's markets there, I'm going to be a rich man. Look at all I've got. And Abraham, God took him immediately. Watch this now. When it says the meek shall inherit the earth, that is not some spiritual pie in the sky that you'll never attain to. God took Abraham and he said, look northward, southward, eastward, and westward. And he said, all the land, and by the way, that's all over the earth. And everything that, the, that you see, I'm going to give it to you and to your seed forever. God was not kidding with this. And what happened? What is the ultimate inheritance of Abraham? It is the new heaven and new earth. What happened to Lot? He lost it all in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. When you refuse to choose meekness in your life, you will reap the benefits or you will reap the rewards of your cockiness and your arrogance thinking you have a right to everything. And I want to tell you, I want to tell you what's killing your marriage is that you think you have a right to everything. Husbands, you think you have a right to your wife and her pleasing you all the time. Wives, you think you have a right for your husband to do this and do that. I want to tell you something. You want to, you want to bless your marriage, you start showing meekness. And what happens when God brings us down and we're mourning and we're bankrupt is all of a sudden we're meek. And, we don't, and when we've been given things, we don't think that we deserve things. When we've lost everything and God gives them back. And I've had that happen. We don't think then that we have a right to have everything given to us. 
These false prophets of prosperity on TV are lying through their teeth when they tell you that you have a divine right to have riches and health and everything else. You don't. You recognize that being meek. Okay. Now, uh, the next one. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. When you were lost, what happened was when you were lost... You had a hunger and a thirst for wickedness. You had a thirst for things. You had a thirst for whiskey. You had a hunger for, for uh, things of this world. You had a hunger for carnal, fleshly things. But all of a sudden you get saved. All of a sudden God, God uh, broke your bank. He's causing you to mourn. He's giving you his spirit. You're now yielding to the will of God in your life. And all of a sudden things that you didn't want to do, you want to do. All of a sudden you find yourself, you know what? I want to read my Bible. Hey, I want to pray. Hey, I want to go to church. Hey, I want to go out and pass out tracts. Hey, pastor, is there anything I can do in the church? Man, I want to serve God. Because you get a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. And God said, you get a hunger and a thirst for righteousness and you shall be filled. Then he said, blessed are the merciful. Now we're going to cycles here. We're rising up. Blessed are the merciful. For they shall obtain mercy. You know what that means? That you realize that as God forgive your sins, all of a sudden you have the ability to start forgiving others. Start forgiving your wife. Start forgiving your husband. Start forgiving your children. Children, forgive your parents. Forgive your pastor. He's not perfect. How dare you think that he is? Forgive your pastor of things that he's done wrong. Pray for him. Pastor, forgive your congregation for sins that you know they're committing. Forgive them of their sins as Christ has forgiven us. In fact, we know the scripture. We know the prayer. We cannot have our sins forgiven until we forgive the sins of others. But God has put us in a new spirit. Now all of a sudden we're having mercy on people. We're looking, we're up here and we're looking down at people and saying, boy, I tell you what, I feel sorry for them. We have mercy on people. We care about lost people. We care about people in our church that are struggling. We care, we care, we care. And then he said, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. All of a sudden our motives are right. The th reason why we're doing, you know, you could be lost and come to church every Sunday, but you're coming for the wrong reason. You're not pure in heart. You have a, you have a wicked, corrupt heart inside of you. Um, a, a preacher I know in the ministry said he had 20 some odd years of straight Sunday school attendance and was lost. Never saved. You can work inside of a church and do, you can tithe, you can do all kinds of things. And your motives not be right. But now all of a sudden God's got in you and you're right. And now your motives are right. You are pure in heart. And then he said, blessed are the peacemakers for they should be called the children of God. What is a peacemaker? It is someone that is trying to make peace between two factions. What is that? That is someone who will witness to a lost man, who will be a blessing, who will pour out the tears of, of the doctrine of Jesus Christ upon a person's soul. They'll hand out videos. They'll hand out tracts. They'll invite people to church. They'll, invite, they'll have set up home Bible studies. They'll do whatever. You know what they're trying to do? They're trying to be a peacemaker between them and God because they're at war. And God, they're fighting against God. They are at enmity with God. The, the flesh is enmity with the spirit. And they are at war with each other. And you're being a soul winner trying to bring them together. You're not trying to bring God down to their level. You're trying to bring them to the, to the cross so that God can meet them there and they can be saved. Okay? So now that's you as a, as a peacemaker. Okay? But then all of a sudden, here's what happens. Now you're at the top. You're soul winning. And then he said, blessed are they, blessed are ye, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All of a sudden, God sends persecution our way. Why? He always does it for our benefit and our good. And then we're being brought back down again. And then he says, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. That is eight, which is the number for new life. And nine, which is a number for fruit bearing. And I'm going to ask you again, do you want the fruitfulness of Christ in your life? God's going to take you on these cycles. And when you're up here, don't ever forget the pit that God drug you out of. And by the way, when you're down here, don't ever forget that every time you were down here, God brought you back up again. Don't ever forget that. I've had this cycle go in my life. And having the knowledge of it helps. Is knowing that if I'm up here. I never will ever want to forget. The pit that God dug me out of. And when I'm down here I never ever. I, 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 I want to remember. 
that every time I've been down here before, God always brought me out. We sing an old song in our hymn books. He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. We, we still sing them old songs in this church. And boy, they mean something. Why don't you take a look at this tree again and these rings. Because every time God does this cycle in your life, you're growing. Yeah, there will be a time in your life when things are dormant. And the clouds are over and it's cold. And it doesn't seem like much is happening, but God's given you rest. And he's going he's to spring it back to life again. And the seeds are going to be planted. And the rain's going to fall. And all of a sudden, you've just kicked back in a new life again. And you're waiting for the harvest time of your life. You cannot, you cannot think of yourself that if you just by the will of your determination and enough prayers that you can make yourself fruitful 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, year round. It's not going to happen that way until God ceases these cycles in the new heaven and a new earth. That's when the cycles are going to be over. Because there's a tree planted up there with 12 manner of fruits and it yields its, it yields its fruit year round. Okay? The cycles then will be done. But for right now, we live under these cycles. Learn from them. You go back after you get done watching this. You go back and you think about all the cycles that God has brought you through. And all the terrible things that you yourself have done that God's have mercy on you and forgiven you. Think about the time when you and your wife looked at each other and said, I want a divorce. And see how God saved you from that. Look at the times when you didn't want to have a forgiving spirit, but all of a sudden God gave you a forgiving spirit. Look at the times when you yourself were in the wasteland of sin and God brought you out of that. And I hope this is a help and a blessing to you. That number one, if you're not saved, God wants to save you, but he's going to have to break your bank. You're going to have to find yourself morally bankrupt before God. And you cannot save yourself and you cannot wait until you start living a better life because it will never happen. It must be the power and the work of the Holy Ghost and the light of Jesus Christ shining in your life or it won't happen. But those of you who are saved and who are Christians, and this may not necessarily agree with your particular doctrine, but I can't help that. I love you anyway. And I want you to take some things that I said and I want you to look at it and examine your life in the light of the scriptures that I've read today and see that these sayings are true in your life. And I just want you to pray, God, thank you for this. Thank you for showing. I didn't, I didn't give you anything. The Holy Ghost wanted you to know this. And I know that because I want to tell you what, it's been tough just getting uh, into this service to record this and to, and to teach this. I mean, it's been tough. And I believe that somebody out there wanted to hear it. I believe God wanted you to know that if you're down here, he will pick you back up again. I love you. God bless you.